specification for XML 1.0 is a list of design goals. And the number six design goal for XML reads as follows. XML documents should be human legible and reasonably clear. And it's a little startling to read that because the idea today that, that XML could have been a binary format or anything but a readable text format is a little disturbing. I've always enjoyed Tim Gray's explanation of this design goal in his annotated XML specification, which is available on XML.com. Tim Gray wrote, this goal was motivated simply by the perception that textual formats are more open, more useful, and more pleasant to work with than binary formats. One of the substantial benefits of XML is no matter how bad a day the, the, your tools are having, you can always pull an XML document into Emacs or Notepad or whatever your favorite editor is and get some useful work done. In other words, although XML is primarily designed to be generated and read by software, it can also be generated and read by humans, and even by humans whose first language isn't hexadecimal. <laughs> What's interesting about XML is this. <coughs> Aside from white space and comments, a human-generated XML document should be indistinguishable from machine-generated XML. As long as the human <coughs> editor leaves the document in a well-formed and valid state, it doesn't matter to either a person or a computer or a program reading the document where it came from and who had their fingers in it. And this seems at first like a very trivial and self-evident quality, and we think any data specification should have this. Um, and yet, historically, it's very rare. Uh, traditionally, programs that were capable of both of reading and writing text documents or binary files were very picky about what they could read. And generally, they wouldn't read anything that deviated too much from what they originally wrote out. To see what I mean, uh, let's consider some of the tools that we've used in the past to assist us in Windows programming. One of the tools that came out of Microsoft in the early days of Windows was a dialog editor. Uh, this dialog editor was not part of the Windows 1.0 SDK in 1985, but it became available about a year later. And one of the first articles I wrote for MSJ Magazine, which has now become MSDN Magazine, was on this dialog editor. As you may know, even before this dialog editor and after it, for many years after, um, the layout of controls in dialog boxes was specified in a text template in a resource script or in a separate file accessible by the resource script. Basically, this template would indicate some of the characteristics of the dialog box, such as the size and the style, and then list all the controls in the dialog box, their sizes, positions, content, uh, the text that appeared in buttons, for example, um, and an ID number for the programs to refer to, to that control. This dialog editor was the first Microsoft tool that let a programmer design a dialog box interactively by dragging controls to the surface. The dialog box would then emit the dialog box template and text, and then the program would refer to this template in a resource script. Uh, this template emitted by the dialog editor looked nothing like anything a human being would write. Uh, a human being writing a, a resource a dialog box template would use lines that begin with the words control or, or scroll bar. When the dialog editor emitted text, it, all the lines began with the word control, followed by the, the class of the control in quotation marks, followed by all the information about the control, whereas the, a human would be very specific about what information was indicated there. And this dialog editor you could go back and re-edit a, a dialog box that you designed, but it had to read in the exact same file that it wrote out. Uh, you really didn't want to mess around with the dialog box templates that the dialog editor wrote out because it, it might reject them later on, and then you'd have to start all over. And until quite recently, this situation, this type of situation, hasn't changed. Um, if you sit down today and write a Windows Forms application, for example, and Windows Forms dates from this century. Uh, if you use the, the Visual Studio Designer, you'll cause Visio, Visual, Visual Studio to generate blocks of code that contain ominous comments. 
required method for designer support. Do not <laughs> modify the contents of this method with the code editor. And I've always considered messages like this to be rather offensive. I mean, whose, whose code is this anyway? <laughs> the problem is that Visual Studio can generate C Sharp or Visual Basic Code. And it can read that code back in, but it expects that code to be in a particular format and restricted to particular types of statements and pretty much the same as when it wrote it out. You could probably go in there and change a few numbers and all, but I don't, I don't know how, I, I really don't know how much you could actually change that code before Visual Studio would really object to it. And then you'd be in trouble. Then you'd have to scrap that and, and kind of start over again. With the introduction of the Windows Presentation Foundation, however, something very fundamental has changed. You can certainly write WPF applications entirely in code using your favorite .NET compliant programming language, but the WPF also supports an XML-based file format known as the Extensible Application Markup Language, XAML, pronounced XAML. Uh, some people have called XAML a declarative programming language. Uh, that seems kind of a stretch to me. I'm, I'm rather skeptical about applying that term to XAML. Uh, basic arithmetic, for example, is absent from XAML. There's no flow control. There are no loops or anything like that. It's, XAML is really basically markup, and I don't think it is yet a programming language. We will see how it evolves in the future. So a, a WPF application can consist of traditional windows and dialog boxes, just like in, in traditional uh, <coughs> windows applications. It can, a WPF application can also consist of pages, which are navigable, and these pages uh, <coughs> resemble uh, pages that you might find on a website. Instead of, of dialog boxes popping out at you, pages navigate to other pages. It, whether, you're, whether you're designing a window or a dialog box or a page, the layout of controls and text and images can be encoded in a XAML file. Uh, this XAML file essentially stores everything <coughs> necessary for the creation and initialization of all of the objects that appear on the surface of the window. This, in other words, it does it contains all the information that is normally found in the constructor for a window-derived class or a page-derived class. The XAML has the information to set up the window or the page, and the code does everything else, which is basically event handling. It could do a little initialization as well on its own, but largely the XAML does the, the, the setup, the code does the event handling in a typical WPF application. But XAML can actually take up a, a, a bit more of the work. It can actually eliminate some of the event handlers that you might otherwise write in code. Um, it does this through a couple of features. One is data binding, where you can hook up a couple of controls or elements with each other. And so when something changes in one thing, it affects something else and you don't have to write an event handler to intermediate that process. Uh, XAML also supports animation, uh, which you <coughs> might, uh, if you wanted to implement animation, otherwise you would be setting up a timer and using event handlers and stuff like that. So Windows applications, which started back in the old days with code, have now come about where uh, they, and they, they are now consistent of both code and markup. And it's kind of the, the opposite of, of the, the web, where the web started with markup and gradually introduced code. But the two, uh, the client programming and the web program, have kind of uh, come to the same place in terms of this balance of code and markup. And, and whether, whether this seeming similarity is profound or superficial, I don't know. That's a metaphysical question. I don't do metaphysical questions. Um, I'm just a programmer. <laughs> At any rate, when you design the layout of a WPF application in Visual Studio, Visual Studio doesn't generate code that says, don't touch me. 
it generates XAML instead. And because XML, theoretically, it doesn't matter to Visual Studio if you go inside that XAML file and tweak something. In fact, uh, many times I write a XAML file outside of Visual Studio, and Visual Studio reads it in. It doesn't complain about it. It usually doesn't display exactly what I thought it might. Um, I, I am not sure what Visual Studio is using to, to interpret XAML files, but it usually looks a little different. Uh, from, from what happens when you actually run that file. Um, but, for the first time in Windows application programming, we can mess around with the files created by the visual designer. Uh, XAML is likely to have some impacts that, that to me, as, as somebody who sits at home by himself and writes code, uh, wasn't really didn't really think about. For example, uh, some larger software companies employ designers who are responsible for the, the look of the application. And these designers often do mock-ups of what the application should look like with all the controls position. But they don't, they don't actually <coughs> do a, 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 a program. They, they design a bitmap with all this stuff. And they, and they turn the bitmap over to the programmer. And the programmer sits down and tries to mimic the appearance of that bitmap using code. XAML is going to revolutionize this relationship between the programmer and developer. There are applications such as Microsoft Expression which give programmers and designers the opportunity to share <coughs> common XAML files so that the designer could be, work, could be doing the designing of it using the XAML file then the programmer could be writing the program using the same XAML file. And so the, the appearance of the application is largely separated from the functionality, the design and development of the application can proceed simultaneously and fairly independently until it comes time to join all this stuff together. Although we can theoretically hand edit XAML files that Visual Studio or Microsoft Expression creates, nobody's forcing us to. Nobody's forcing us to even look at XAML files. If we prefer we could simply interactively design our windows and pages and dialog boxes and ignore all that ugly XML stuff that Visual Studio is generating and instead simply focus on the code if we wanted to. I wonder how our attitudes towards XAML might have been different if the Windows Presentation Foundation hadn't had such a long public gestation period under the code name of Avalon. I wonder how things might have been different if Microsoft had kept the whole thing under wraps until Avalon and all the Avalon-related design tools such as Visual Studio and Expression were ready for the public. Suppose, too, in this imaginary alternative that Microsoft hadn't even given a name to XAML. It was known simply by some bland ex description and file name expression. For example, just like there is a, uh, the Visual Studio admits a, a C-sharp project file with the extension csproj, and uh, not too many people actually look at that file. Um, maybe in this alternative universe, Visual Studio would have emitted some other XML stuff. Uh, it had the file name expression of WPFAM. Nobody would know how it was pronounced. It would stand for Windows Presentation Foundation Application Markup, for example. And it's, so it's not too hard for me to imagine an alternative universe in which XAML existed, much like it is now, but it was largely ignored by the programmer. A universe in which WPF programmers didn't even bother to learn the syntax of XAML and focus strictly on code. Uh, there are some people today who feel that's a desirable attitude and situation. There's a contingent of people who believe that XAML is for tools. Um, and I am absolutely positive that there will come a day when the vast majority of XAML is machine written. Uh, that might even be the case today. I don't know. Ten years from now, 20-something programmers I find it amusing that once upon a time, programmers actually wrote XAML by hand. In reality, things are way different. Uh, the gestation and development of Avalon and the WPF was very long. It was very public. 
And literally, for years, there were no tools available to learn XAML. Uh, those of us who wrote early magazine articles about Avalon um, and, WP, and books about WPF, uh, we grew up writing XAML by hand. It feels like I grew up. I, I mean, I've, I've been do I wrote my first XAML four years ago, uh, so it feels like I've been working with it a long time. And those of us who wrote XAML by hand and who write XAML by hand today, we discover some very interesting facts. Um, I have always lived by the assumption that code rules and you can't do anything in markup. Um, but we found, much to our surprise, that XAML has some basic, ad basic advantages over the equivalent code. For one thing, XAML is generally shorter and more succinct. Uh, this shows uh, a, a C-sharp code example and the equivalent over on the right in XAML. It's just a text box and a button that are children of a staff panel. I found the succinctness of XAML to be quite surprising because XML is not known for being concise. Uh, earlier I mentioned the design goals listed in the original XML specification. The last of those ten goals is terseness in XML markup is of minimal importance. <laughs> and indeed, in a lot of databases, I mean, there's, there's, lots of, there's lots of overhead for each and every record. But apparently, the verbosity of XML, as it made its way into XAML, is nothing compared with the verbosity of the C-sharp code. Uh, XAML achieved some of this concision by not requiring explicit new expressions to create the stack panel and the text box and block and the button. Um, it doesn't require an object name to hang out with the, with the uh, object being created. Uh, it, and there is massive underlying software support for that XAML syntax. There is a whole bunch of conversion classes that allow shortcuts in specifying the values of uh, the C-sharp properties which become attributes in, in the XAML. Uh, for example, if the property is an enumeration such as horizontal alignment, uh, you only need to use the enumeration member center rather than preceded by the whole enumeration name such as you must do in C-sharp. Uh, similarly, for the background property, uh, or uh, foreground, and, you know, foreground property, uh, which you set to a, a static member of the brushes classes in XAML, you can just say blue. Um, in C sharp, the, the margin property, uh, which is a, a object of type thickness, becomes a simple number in XAML. All of this stuff is accomplished by a lot of software support. As we programmers wrote XAML more and more, we discovered other advantages. Uh, we discovered that XAML is ideal for representing the nested layout of WPF, uh, the nested structure of WPF layout. Uh, much more so than the equivalent code, the indentation of XAML shows that the text block and the button elements are children of the stack panel. You can see the stack panel begin and end tag and the text blocks and button within there. You can't see that relationship in the code example. You have to actually examine the syntax and get down here and say, oh, text block was made, was added to the children collection of the stack panel, so it must be a child of the stack. Layout in the w, in WPF applications can go much, much deeper than this. Uh, the WPF supports a variety of standard panels. You can have panels nested in other panels. Uh, WPF supports an extremely versatile and generalized content model that I'll be talking about in my first talk. In this particular example, the content of the button is just text. But the content of the button could itself be a panel. And that panel could contain other panels. And those panels could contain images and text and stuff like that. So this nesting could go way, way deep. And the XAML, as long as you don't go too far over to the right margin, the XAML reflects that nesting very visually. And you just don't get it in the code. The deeper the nesting of panels and controls, the more ideal is XAML is for representing this nested structure. Or is it the other way around? It's possible that <clears throat> once the WPF developers started representing stuff with XAML, 
they realize that other possibilities of, of, of making this, this kind of nested structure more generalized so that you can have panels and elements nested inside controls such as buttons. <clears throat> I don't know if, if how the actual uh, indentation of the XAML affected their thoughts on this or not. I wasn't there, but it's entirely plausible. It's a well-known phenomenon that tools, the tools we have, govern how we think about problems. And it's certainly the case with programming languages. Uh, the way we formulate problems, even, is dependent upon what languages we're using. You give the same pro problem to a C programmer and a Lisp programmer, and you're going to have two very different solutions. And if, you, if a, a, a programmer comes up, in my, my own experience, uh, many years ago, I worked for New York Life Insurance Company here in New York. Our main language was PL1. But then we were introduced to APL. And uh, a language that used to, uh, to do matrix, uh, to work, to perform operations on entire matrices. And our entire way of thinking about the, the problems we were solving with programming uh, altered when we started using APL. So not only is XAML terser than C sharp for object creation and initialization, not only does XAML better represent the nested layout structure, but XAML is also easier to experiment with. Or, if you will, XAML is easier to play with. You can play with XAML in a way that you can't play around with code. What makes this playtime possible is a class named XAML Reader and a static method named Load. The XAML Reader .load method reads a XAML file and gives you an object corresponding to that XAML file. If XAML Reader .load read this XAML, well, it would need a, a, a namespace declaration, but it would spit out an object of type stack panel. But it's not just a single object. That object will have ch generally have children or contents that will be other objects. And you, you get back the, the, the same object, which you can, can then display right on your window. There's also a XAML writer.save method, which goes in the opposite direction. You give it an object, and it will emit the corresponding XAML. And very often, this XAML looks a lot like what a human might write. So among the tools that accompany the WPF software development kit is a program called XAMLpad, which basically it lets you interactively type in some XAML, the, the two tick marks, the whole thing is in these two uh, path elements, which also use a style that was set away, but all this is WPF stuff. Um, I am currently working on a book, as, as um, Jeff Grossi said, on 3D programming using WPF. Um, XAML Cruncher, I just found essential for interactively experimenting with the 3D classes. Uh, in fact, <coughs> I enjoyed the immediate feedback of XAML Cruncher so much that I added a feature to it. Um, this will be available in XAML Cruncher 2.0, which I hope to make available on my website later this month. You can specify that XAML Cruncher load in arbitrary DLLs using the <coughs> assembly.loadFrom method. And because these DLLs are part of, of are available to the XAML Cruncher application, they're available to any uh, piece of XAML that runs under the application. So you can actually refer to classes in this external DLL uh, from the XAML file in, in XAML Cruncher. So I have been developing a, uh, a library, a DLL of, of uh, 3D classes to do um, uh, spheres and cylinders and stuff like that and do other stuff. And I've been able to experiment with these classes in XAML Cruncher. Now, the actual XAML that you get out of that isn't really runnable by itself. If you tried to run it under, under IE, it wouldn't run. But you can, you, know, you can make a program out of it. So it's, it's good to experiment with. Um, this is not to imply that XAML Cruncher is entirely free from headaches. Uh, the program has had a chronic problem of progressively slowing down the more you work with it. Um, and 
I really need to do more ex exploration of this, but I have, I think the problem involves the XAML reader.load method that it's using to convert the XAML into objects. It seems that if that method encounters a problem in, in, in the XAML file, um, and it starts reading the XAML file and interpreting it from top to bottom, if it encounters a problem in valid XML or, or something else, it raises an exception. XAML Cruncher responds by setting the text red so you know that it's like that. Um, and uh, so you, you know there's a problem in your, your XAML. But what happens, it, but, but before that happens, uh, the XAML reader.load method seems to have created a bunch of objects and, and hooked them together, made some the children of other objects. And from what I can see, some of these objects do not become eligible for garbage collection, even though they've been abandoned um, and they have really no external links. Something, because they're linked together, and some of them may even be performing animations at the time, um, somehow they don't seem to be garbage collected. And maybe I'm going to be sitting down with Jeff Richter for uh, a half an hour this afternoon to try to figure out this problem. At any rate, more research is needed. Um, it is obvious to me that XAML is directly influencing the choices I make in object-oriented design. And let me show you what I mean. Um, sometime in the waning years of the last century, I got interested in positional astronomy which is basically the mathematics of determining where a particular celestial body will be in the sky at a particular instant in time from a particular location on the Earth. Um, it might be assumed that I got interested in this because I live in New York City. We can't actually see anything in the sky, uh, so we need to do math in order to figure out where things are. That's not entirely true. We can, we can, we can certainly see planets in New York City, and uh, sometimes we can see planets in the daytime. Um, and I remember part of the reason I wrote this program was that uh, during the, there was a summer when my fiance Deirdre and I would see the same two planets every night in the, in the summer sky, close, close by each other. And they, as the summer went on, they gradually shifted across the sky. It turned out they were Jupiter and Saturn. Um, so in, in the waning years of the last century, when I was still coding using the Win32 API, I wrote this program called Solar System. Um, the initial screen shows a view of the solar system from far and north. Um, there's the sun in the middle, the Earth is a green color, Mars is red, Mercury and Venus, and uh, Jupiter and Saturn there. Um, these planets normally revolve in a counter, uh, always revolve in a counterclockwise direction uh, around the sun when you're looking at this from, from far north. This is currently set to the current day and time, but I have this little Mobus dialog box and I can unsync the time and then I can manipulate these scroll bars uh, to uh, change the time. And the scroll bars are set up so that when they get down to the bottom or the top, they roll around and flip the next one up or down. Um, so this was kind of cool. I could interactively uh, watch the planets go around like that. Uh, where does the data come from? Um, if, you, if you get into this positional astronomy stuff, you'll probably begin with a book um, such as uh, this classic, Astronomical Algorithms. Um, the positions of the planets are calculated from a so-called theory called BSOP, uh, which I won't attempt to French. It's the secular variations of the planetary orbits. It's basically a Fourier series with many, many terms that give you the coordinates of the planets in potentially a couple different ways. Um, what's shown here is a fairly direct visual representation of the heliocentric spher uh, uh, spherical coordinates. Um, these heliocentric spherical coordinates are based on the average plane of the Earth's orbit, which is called the ecliptic, uh, with the sun in the center. Uh, for each planet and uh, 
each point in time, you get three numbers. The radius is the distance of the planet from the sun. The longitude is an angle around the orbit measured from the vernal equinox, which is the line up at top labeled autumn. Uh, the latitude is an angle north or south of the, from the plane of the ecliptic. And this latitude is uh, close to zero for all the planets because all the planets orbit in roughly the same plane. These heliocentric spherical coordinates are easily convertible to three-dimensional rectangular coordinates using x, y, and z in a three-dimensional Cartesian coordinate system. If you subtract the rectangular coordinates of the Earth from the rectangular coordinates of any of these planets, you get the rectangular coordinates of the planet relative to the Earth. And that's still relative to the ecliptic, which is the plane of the orbit of the Earth around the Sun. At this point, you convert those back to spherical coordinates, so you can come, and you can also convert them to equatorial coordinates. So they are on a, a relative to a plane that's even with the Earth's equator. And at this point, these coordinates become known as right ascension and declination. And I have another little display. Oh, here, here they are. I'm going to show you that later. I have another little display: right ascension and declination. Um, I have some stars in this display. Some of the planets are labeled. Again, uh, you can change the date and time, um, but notice the stars don't change. The stars are fixed with regard to, to right ascension and declination. The planets change relative to the background of the stars. Then you take a particular location on Earth. And here I have a little setting. This great Windows dialog box for entering longitude and latitude. It's set currently for New York City. Um, and you can display the altitude and azimuth, which is, these are called horizontal coordinates. They're relative to the horizon. Um, the horizon is that line. Um, let me sync back the time again. So we can see the sun in the sky. Mars is in the sky right now. The moon is on its way to being set. Um, south is in the middle. Notice I also uh, notated on this axis uh, New York City South and New York City East and New York City West. Uh, these are basically uptown, crosstown uh, directions, um, which are useful if you actually go out in the street and try to find something. Um, the, the New York City coordinates offset from actual compass coordinates by anybody know? You haven't been reading my, my, my website, 29 degrees. I have a nice paper on there uh, about <coughs> how I demonstrated that offset. Um, ever since I started, so this is a Win32 program. The, the code is a god awful mess. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I started with you know testing out all the. This is a lot of math in here. It's a lot of trig. Testing out all the formulas in a command line program, and then glomming on a Windows interface onto that, and and. Uh, there's like, I abandoned one program and commented half of it out and then used part of that and another. And it's just, you wouldn't want to look at it. it it's, uh, I, and I really wanted, ever since I started coding in Windows Forms, I wanted to convert this program to C-sharp and make it nice and object-oriented, have everything in nice, compact little classes. Um, and then I, I started thinking, well, what should my objects be? It's the, it's the question. The basic question of object-oriented programming, and it's it's a tough question because if you can't answer this question, um, you you can't get much further than typing public class, and then you don't know what to type. <laughs> and I knew there should be a class named Planet. I knew that that's the class that should do all this uh, VSOP calculations. Um, I knew that I'd have other classes named Mercury, Venus, Earth, so on, that would derive from planet, but would be very short, um, because they'd be letting the BSOP class do all the work. That's about it. I didn't know about the classes that would actually display this stuff. Um, I didn't know about the relationship between those classes and the planet classes, so I, I never converted this program in wind forms. Um, and I started thinking about this program again with WPF. And I knew that whatever classes I created, I wanted them in a DLL so that I could play with them in XAML Cruncher. 
I wanted to mess around with this stuff in Zymo culture. So I wasn't really <coughs> interested in actually writing an application like this. I wanted some, some, some WPF elements that I could, I could mess around with. Um, what I'm going to show you is uh, nowhere near being finished because it's, it's only, it's really just a few days of work. Um, I was hoping to get much more done. Um, but, alas, these things always take longer. I, was, uh, I had a nasty bug last night where the planets were bouncing around in the sky in a way that you just, they just shouldn't have been doing, and I managed to get that. Um, as you can see, I have the third line from the top after the two normal lines, um, which, which are the XML namespace uh, specifications for it, for the, um, the two regular XAML files, I reference my own DLL, which is a namespace and assembly in Hetzel, that positional astronomy, and it's given a uh, XML prefix of PA. The rest of this WPF, of this XAML file, is just a, a, a three-part grid um, with a couple of grid splitters. Um, one of the first things I did, which was the, it was pretty obvious to me that I'd need this, was a time panel. Oops, let's be case correct. And there it is. Um, I, I have a, a class named time which has a, a uh, actually, it's a structure name time, which ha which stores internally a regular .NET daytime object, but also uh, does other calculations that's necessary for this program to work. Um, this time panel um, set accesses that uh, structure to set its time, but I can also desync it and uh, do the same thing I did before of of making these scroll bars uh, be incremental. Um, I did that by actually making the scroll bars go one more and one less than the actual range, and then it was a, it's some messy logic, but that's what I did. Um, then, after I had done this, done the, the planet and the, the planet derivatives, I, thought, I want my basic display to be the solar system, such as I had on the initial screen of the Windows program. And this I call Solar System 2D. And it should show up right up there. Um, let me put it down. Oh, that'll be all right for now. Okay. And these show the position of the planets um, as they are right now. As you can see, the blue dot is Earth, and we're headed towards summer, which is good. Um, now, these two things aren't yet connected, but this time panel on the left has a pro public property named time, of type time, and this solar system 2D element has a property named time. It's actually a set only property. So what I can do is define a binding between these two elements. <coughs> Give this one a name, time panel. And the binding looks something like this. It's a special XML syntax. Binding element name equals time panel, path equals, no quote there, time, and now this time panel and this display should be linked up so that I can control the movement of the planets with the time panel. I mean, all right. You know, in Windows, um, this was just kind of all code written together. Here, it's two independent elements that are hooked together with a binding. 
एंड you think I named it Solar System 2D just because, well, there is a 3D <laughs> version. <laughs> Fail me now, please. And there it is. <laughs> okay. Now, in order to show this stuff in 3D, you really can't show everything scaled to the actual distances and sizes. You really have to make a lot of fiddling around with the sizes to get it all on one screen. But let's desync the time. Let's increase. Let's go for the hour. So, there we go. The Earth rotates and the moon goes around the Earth like that. Um, I pulled off these. Uh, these, these mapping images from a uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory website. Here's incrementing by days. Um, you can see the moon actually goes through Venus. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and they just, they just wrap around the spheres. The spheres are part of my uh, the 3D library that I'm developing in part of the 3D book. Um, After another day or two of work, I could probably show you an animation of a rocket of, of being on a rocket ship and actually moving through this 3D solar system because the actual position that you're viewing it here is uh, specified by a, a, a camera object which is in the 3D scene. And that camera object can be is, is given a specific location in, in three dimensions and a specific place spot to direction to look at and you can move it around with animation. So that'll be one of the possibilities. That'll be future playtime for Charles working <laughs> with this program. Um, the other element that I've developed is called night sky. <coughs> move this back. And uh, this is actually the, um, I'm not sure what the default is, but there's a, there's a, a type property. Thermal Cruncher has no IntelliSense, unfortunately, so. Uh, <laughs> horizontal coordinates. Okay. And um, as you increase, as you change the hour, this basically shows the planets and other stuff uh, rising in the east, uh, achieving <coughs> maximum altitude at, at the south, and setting somewhere in the west along this line called the ecliptic. I don't have the celestial dome part of this, um, but that would basically show them going across the, the, the dome as you see across the sky. Now, this particular display, the rectangular coordinates is based on location, where you are on the Earth. Uh, <coughs> let me, I'm going to put this in the lower part of the grid. And I also designed what I call a location panel, because night sky has a location property of type geographic coordinates, which is the longitude and latitude. And this location panel also has a location property. I'll call this loc. And uh, location is actually called location panel. And make it bigger. And there it is. Okay. Instead of specifying one student latitude in the dialog box, it's the actual map of the Earth. Now. In order to use that with the night sky, we do another binding. Location property this time equals binding, element name equals loc, path equals location. <laughs> and this, what I, well, why isn't that working? Thank you. I'm missing, I'm missing a little, um, 
extra closing day. You've already closed the tag below that, that last line. Oh, really? Is it closed tag? twice? Uh, there we go. Okay. Now, the location properties of these two things are connected, and we should be able to look at the night sky as it appears in Seattle, for example. And everything moves <coughs> back in time, or over in England, or <coughs> in the southern hemisphere. And this is, I love this stuff. If you go up to the north, <laughs> you know, everything, um, like at some point, like the day, the sun should ride the horizon there and just be a little above the horizon and the sun just goes, keeps going there and there. Anyway, um, this is, this type of structure I would never have conceived either in Win32 programming or in, in WinForms programming. This type of structure of making these things elements that can be hooked together through bindings was specifically something that came about when I was playing around with XAML. Um, what did I learn from all this? Well, in my talk this morning, I'm going to be talking about, among other things, dependency properties. Um, this is something that is introduced in WPF. Um, it's, an, it's, a, it's like an add-on to the existing property structure. It looks like a mess when you first see it in, in actual code, but it's extremely important. Um, all the binding and animation stuff is, is built on these dependency properties. And the dependency properties allow a program to respond, to pro uh, pro allow a class to respond to property changes in a very structured manner. Um, all, and you get to a point where you start designing classes for WPF and you just say, to hell with it. Everything's going to be a dependency property. And you eventually are very happy you did it that way. Um, another thing, I, because I was playing around with, with, um, with 3D, um, I, I started looking at this as, as, particularly this night sky, as being uh, two things. One, a collection of objects you're going to see. Uh, collections are very big in WPF. And two, a, a perspective from which you see them. And so I uh, came, came up with this property um, named um, Home Planet. Home Planet is a property of night sky. And conceivably, you could set home planet equal to Mars and then see everything from Mars. Well, I'd love to demonstrate that for you. Um, however, I, I, more research is needed before I can do the actual math. The math is what's needed. The, the class structure is already there. Uh, the class structure is already there to do this night sky from Mars or the Moon or someplace else. I also um, had there's a good whiteboard for me, right? Um, there's a lot of trig in this stuff, and uh, as you know, when you uh, the, the the math class in .NET um, has a bunch of trig functions, normal trig functions using radians, and often it's convenient to use angles. And in astronomy, you're even dealing with with expressing uh, degrees rather. Uh, in, in astronomy, you're also, uh, it's also customary to express angles in terms of hours, where 24 hours equals 360 degrees. Um, so I didn't want a lot of confusion about converting radians to angles. I didn't want to have to remember, is this, is this, is this radians, is this, is this degrees, is, what do I convert? And so I decided very early on, This is about midpoint. I would have a structure named angle. Internally, of course, the structure 
would store an angle in radians. But I'd also have a public degrees property. And this would have get and set accessors that would convert degrees to radians. So um, if I if I <coughs> use, for example, the expression ang dot degrees, that would actually return degrees to me. Um, instead of there's two different if you're if you're doing something like this, where you have an entity like an angle that can be represented in a couple different ways, there's a couple of ways you can do constructors. You could define an enumeration which would be like angle type, and it would have uh, a couple of members, degrees, radians, hours. And you could require that a member of that enumeration to be in your constructor. Um, I decided to go a different route by making static um, properties. Public static returns type angle and uh, the, the method's called from degrees value. And basically this, um, this creates a new object of type angle and then sets the degrees property value. Okay. I haven't written on a blackboard in a very long time, as you can tell. All right, so this would prevent me from um, being confused. Instead of dealing with doubles, which could be either uh, degrees or radians, I dealt with an object of type angle. At first, I was going to implement the trig functions as static methods in here. And I started thinking about it, and I thought, aren't trig functions sine and the cosine and the tangent, aren't those properties of the angle? So I tried this, um, public double sine property, my get accessor, return math dot sine of radius. Very simple. So I could get, if I had an object of type ang, I could get the sign of that by simply saying ang dot sign. Does this property have a set accessor? And I wasn't sure, but it seemed to me as if this might be it. Radians equals math dot inverse sign of the value. <coughs> so that this, the get accessor got the sign, but the set accessor gets the arc sign. And I wasn't quite sure whether this made sense. I wasn't quite sure whether this was trivial or whether this was profound. <laughs> um, but basically, what it would let you do is this. Sometimes you, see an ex uh, sometimes you need to calculate something where it's uh, sine of minus 1 equals blah, 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 all right, an angle here. You want the angle that is correspond the, the inverse sine of that stuff. <coughs> and instead, in my syntax, I would have this. Ang dot sine equals that big expression. And in fact, in this book that I'm using, this is often how these expressions are written. Instead of using an inverse sine, the sine is written on the left side, like that. Uh, nobody can see that. Um, I also realized that this made sense when we wrote something like ang dot sine equals ang dot sine 
Um, that expression works, except that the angle is normalized on, because it's getting gotten a sign here and then an arc sign to, for the assignment, so it becomes normalized. Um, so this seemed to all make sense. And so I implemented sine, cosine, and tangent like this. And I said, let's, let's see how, how, if I get in trouble doing this. And I did get in trouble. Um, the problem was the tangent property. Because the regular arc tangent function only returns uh, angles in the range of minus 90 degrees and 90 degrees. And that's why the, the, the ATAN2 method it, function is so popular um, for doing inverse tangents. Uh, because the, the regular inverse tangent function doesn't quite make it for all, all possible uses. So yes, I did get into trouble. But for the sines and cosines, it worked just fine. And I finally had to implement another method.